to answer these questions. Uh, David has been using, consulting, and writing about marketing automation for more than 30 years. His clients have included major firms in financial services, healthcare telecommunications, publishing, consumer goods, technology, and other industries. We're also going to cover one of the questions I hear all the time uh, when I'm onboarding and training or generally talking about marketing automation. I often hear, marketing automation sounds great, but how do you deploy it? We have Calvin Sharp, Vice President of Marketing and Product Development at Lingotech here to share his experience and tips on how to successfully deploy a marketing automation solution. He has over 20 years of experience managing product sales, marketing, operations, and personnel. His experience ranges from work with Fortune 500 companies to small startups. We'll be emailing a link to the recorded webinar to all that registered, and that link should go out in the next uh, next day or so. Uh, thank you, David and Calvin, for presenting. And I'll turn the webinar over to you now. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, welcome, everyone. Pleasure to be here. I'm David Robb, Principal of Robb Associates. As uh, Mike said, we've been doing marketing automation uh, for more years than I care to admit, uh, but the future, of course, is always more interesting than the past. So let's take a look at, at marketing automation. Now, marketing automation is growing. It's, uh, we estimate it grew about 50% last year, and it'll grow another 50% this year. So that's pretty healthy. Most of us would be very happy if our businesses grew at 50% rate, but the glass is really half full, half empty. It's, the market is far from penetrated. There's about 20,000 marketing automation installations among, across all the vendors in the industry, according to our figures. Um, and that's about across about a million companies with five million revenue or, or higher revenue. And that's even if only a third of those companies are B2B, those million companies, that's just still just a 6% penetration rate. Marketing automation has been around for, well, many, many years, but even B2B marketing automation has been, been around for, for 10 years or more. So how does an industry go on for so long and, and grow from a very, very low base and still have uh, just 6% just penetration? And, and even more interestingly, about half of those companies are probably tech, half of those 20,000. 20, uh, so once you get outside the tech industries, marketing automation penetration is really, really low. So what is the problem? Why has marketing automation not, in fact, grown more quickly than it had? And why hasn't it really penetrated more industries? Well, if you ask the marketing automation vendors, the answer they'll typically give you is, is, is that it's the marketer's fault. Our products are great, but marketers, they just don't know how to do marketing automation. It's a new thing for them. It's something that takes a lot of skills that are not traditional marketing skills. Uh, it's a technology they have to learn. They are left brain, not right brain. Um, or is it the other way around? Uh, and you know that's why marketing automation hasn't grown quickly enough. It's because it's, it's really hard. And the, and the vendors then look at that, and they say, OK, if that's the problem, let's make our systems easier to use, and you constantly hear vendors talking about their new release, how it's so much easier than the old release, which in turn was so much easier than the release before that one, and the new vendor, the new kid on the block is, is so much easier than everyone who's come before that. So they, they look on ease of use in terms of the system, or they'll take a strategy that says, well, we're just going to give a whole bunch of support to our clients, to train them really well, and, and just give them the skills that they need to succeed with marketing automation because they don't have it, or we'll actually just take an agency model, we'll kind of do it for them. So they keep focusing on the skill gap. And the skill gap is important, but it's not clear to me. And I, honestly, I don't think the skill gap is really the issue. If you look at the surveys, we saw a couple of surveys recently that looked at the priority that marketers gave to marketing automation. Man, it's this hot new thing. It's growing really quick. You would think it'd be right up there. Well, one survey, it ranked number seven out of nine priorities. Another survey, it was number nine out of 12 priorities listed. So marketing automation simply isn't at the top of the list of things that B2B marketers are worried about today. 
So the question is why. It's, 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 is it they don't make it a priority because they know they don't have the skills to do it? I, I would argue not. I would argue they don't make it a priority because there's a big gap between the promise and the reality of marketing automation. When you listen to marketing automation vendors, and I'm, this is in general, not, sim, not uh, singling out any particular vendor, uh, they talk about the system that does, meets all your marketing needs. Well, the whole reason we need marketing automation today is that the buying process has changed. And you all know this, so I'm not going to belabor this point. But we know that buyers today are self-motivated. They do all the things. They can do all their research. They can find out about the companies. They can find out about the options. They can find out about which system does what, what they cost, whether the users are happy, who their typical clients are, what the functionality is, all the things that people used to have to talk to a company salesperson to get they can get on the internet, or at least a lot of those things. So that fundamental change in the buying process is why marketers have to do things differently. They have to adapt to the new buying process, which means they have to make a lot more information available. They have to uh, reach out to customers in ways that, or to put prospects in ways that meet the needs of the prospects, not so much the needs of the salespeople. They have to gather information in ways that are more subtle than having a salesperson just ask, well, you got a budget this quarter or don't you? Um, so that has changed. The other thing that's changed is that the, the, mar the buyer customer management, sometimes called customer experience management, really extends beyond simply that sales stage or that acquisition stage to include sales and service because so much happens in particular on the web People are on the website when they're first researching, when they're active buyers, after they're buying, when they're customers, all through the web, all through the, the customer life cycle, people's customer experiences are being mediated, in particular on the web and through email and through other kinds of automated interactions, all of which should be controlled by marketing automation because they're all fundamentally marketing activities, even sales and service at the end of the day are about getting, making customers happy and keeping them as customers and getting them to become uh, better customers, more lucrative customers. So the promise of marketing automation is, yes, this world has changed and we are the solution that's going to help you cope with this new world. We're the tool that's going to, we're the key that's going to open this new door to success. The reality of marketing automation today is that it's mostly about lead nurturing. It's mostly about we send emails, we buy lists, or we acquire lists to inbound marketing. We, we then send emails. We get somebody to kind of sign on. We then assess them and lead score them. If they're ready to go to sales, we, we push them off to sales and basically lose sight of them. If they're not ready, we do multi-step lead nurturing. And most of the discussion in the industry is about doing these very uh, sophisticated and, and uh, kind, of, kind of fun, if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, campaigns that are, that, are, that are good lead nurture campaigns. And, and the, most of the, of the discussion of the value of marketing automation is how many more of your leads you're actually going to convert and how much more efficient it is and all the rest. So the reality of marketing automation is that it's kind of in that little lead nurture bucket there, which is sort of doesn't really do lead acquisition. That's a different thing and it certainly doesn't do sales and service. So a marketer looks at this and they say, well, I'm worried about all those things. But the only thing the marketing automation is solving is that one little slice. And that one little slice, email and events, which are the two things that marketing automation basically does, uh, today about 20% of the program budget, uh, according to one study that we saw. Um, all right, so again, they're, they're just solving this little one, one part of the problem. So mar that's why marketers who have to look at the whole picture say, well, you know, yeah, marketing automation is a cool thing. Uh, but, you know, it's not my number one priority because I've got a lot of other things, a lot of other problems that marketing automation simply isn't going to address for me. So at least this is my belief, is that this is why marketing automation hasn't really been adopted much more fully than it has been, simply because marketers are very rational, and they say, well, you know, I've got a lot of problems. This only solves one of them. 
I'm going to have to give it some of my attention, but I'm going to have to do a whole bunch of other things as well. So I can't take on this, this very daunting task of learning all these cool new skills that I'd be perfectly happy to learn, because after I learn, I'm still not going to have, not going to touch 80% of my budget. So all right, so that's at least the David Robb theory of why the marketing automation growth rate is relatively slow. And, and now vendors look at this and they say, OK, we recognize this. We kind of have two strategies that we can adopt to address it. The one is I can be a platform. I can try to cover that full spectrum. Now, to be a platform, and this is what the, you know, the, the guys who basically can afford it do, because it's a very expensive proposition, I have to build out all those other capabilities, all the other 80% of capabilities that are required. I have to have a, a very powerful database that stores all the information that I gather through my marketing automation system and makes it accessible directly to CRM, and makes it accessible for analytics, and makes it accessible for predictive modeling, and makes it accessible for all the things that I want to do with it. I have to have powerful data management capabilities for things like data quality and deduplication and uh, data appending and all these other things that I need to do to really make that database usable. I have to have content creation capabilities. I might even have web serving capabilities or certainly landing page serving capabilities. I have to add a whole bunch of functionalities that make me really allow me to do all the things to do that missing 80%. Uh, and, and, that's, and maybe I do it all myself, or maybe I provide the platform and then I let other, other systems plug in to provide, you know, say, the content creation pieces. Why should I reinvent that when other people do it really well? But I need to at least to have the integration possible. And we won't go into it now, but it's one of the interesting things is that that kind of uh, app-style plug-in integration becomes this, this possible today. It wasn't 10 years ago. The other strategy that vendors can take is they can say, well, you know, being a platform is really hard. There are huge scale economies, but I'm not a big company, so I can't make that big investment and I can't really justify it because I don't expect that I'm going to be one of the top two or three players in the industry anytime soon. Uh, so I can be a niche vendor instead and I'll just pick off one little slice of customers who I'll serve better than anybody else and maybe I'll do it by industry and we see a lot of vertical automation going on now. Maybe I'll do it by providing low cost, maybe I'll do it by providing like super duper ease of use, because they're all easy to use, just ask them, they'll tell you. Um, or maybe I can do it by providing full agency type services and make it so easy for the vendor to uh, do, basically do it for the marketer, or at least hook them up with an agency who will do the work for them. So a lot of niche strategies that are a little more accessible to, to a smaller vendor. Um, and, and vendors pretty much have to choose, you know, one or the other. And those, those are, and the niche strategy, let's be clear, they kind of leave you stuck, not stuck, but they leave you addressing that middle slice of the spectrum. They say, I'm not going to be everything to everybody. I'm just going to do the one thing that marketing automation kind of is, or traditionally does, and I'm going to do it really, really well with whatever the particular niche uh, strength is that I, that I decide to focus on. So those are vendor strategies. Well, that's great, but you're not a vendor. You're a marketer. So marketers have their own strategies, and it's a slightly different set of issues. They can either buy a platform system. Do I want marketing to be sort of the central customer management department in the company? And the answer is, well, yeah, I want it to be. The real question is, can marketing be the central customer management department in the company? And that has to do with you know the company's uh, strategy and are we allowed to say politics and you know, all the issues that determine why companies do what they do. Um, so, you know, maybe I will and maybe I won't. That's a strategy I can take. And if I want that, then obviously I want a vendor who's going to have that full spectrum of capabilities. Or do I want to think about marketing automation as one of several tools that I'm going to have? And essentially it's going to be an add-on to the CRM platform. The CRM platform in this other view of the world is really that core customer management tool. And that's what CRM kind of was invented as. Um, and marketing automation is just this one set of capabilities revolving around lead nurturing, basically, or, or lead management, a little slightly more broadly. Um, but it's not has no pretense to being the master. All right. So as a marketer, I can kind of take 
either of those strategies. Now, what you'll immediately have noticed, of course, is that platform appears on both lists, but add-on appears on this list and niche appeared on the other. So there's a sort of a mismatch between what are viable vendor strategies and what are viable marketer strategies. Now, being an add-on to CRM is actually, again, it's a good thing for the marketer, and some vendors have chosen that as well. So, you know, this is what marketers need. This is what we're going to do. And you see companies who are very closely integrated with the CRM tools who are taking the strategy, and it happens to be Formix is one of them. They're run by Cloud, Cloud which is a, basically a sales enablement type company. So, you know, they've taken this, and that's good. But I'm, I'm not saying it's the only strategy or even the right strategy, but I'm saying that it is, it is an option. A vendor can do this, but it's a, you kind of have to give up your dreams of glory if you're going to do that. You're not going to be the central platform if you're an add-on platform. Now, the result of all this is that buyers have a lot of choices. It's really confusing out there. First of all, the systems all sound alike. They all look alike. Uh, you know, we spend our days and nights doing nothing but looking at marketing automation systems, and you know, after a while, they kind of all blur together. Now, of course, there are subtle distinctions having to do with functionality, having to do with strategy, having to do with target marketing. Well, they're by no means dissimilar, but it's really confusing to, to, for a buyer to be out there, to even even just to make sense of well, what are really my options or what are really the differences, and then what are the differences that matter, because there are a lot of differences that, that fundamentally don't matter. But you know, the good news about that is all that confusion does mean you have a lot of choice and you have more options. So if you choose wisely, you can find a vendor that really meets your needs, right? If you choose not so wisely, you can find a vendor who has a huge mismatch with your needs and you may notice it and you may not notice it because you may just say, oh, marketing automation doesn't work. Well, maybe it would have worked if you uh, made a better choice. So the trick for the marketers is to find the best match. You know, tell me a little about yourself. What are your needs? What do you want? What, and those are two different things, what you need and what you want, as we all know. Not the same thing, right? Um, but you can start with a little bit of a self-assessment. Says, all right, well, you know, am I going to do kind of the standalone platform marketing automation where marketing automation is the central customer management platform of the company? If so, I probably want a vendor that's kind of got that sort of a platform strategy. Or am I going to be more closely, more of a CRM add-on that's going to do what marketing automation does traditionally and not try to be all things to all people? You know? And that, in turn, as I say, that choice has to do with your company's marketing strategy. Um, and a lot, of, you know, a lot of B2B companies, especially smaller B2B companies, marketing is not going to be dominant. Just the realities of it is that sales kind of drives things. So you're more likely to be, in most cases, uh, this sort of a CRM uh, add-on situation. It's not a bad thing. It's not, I'm not denigrating that. Um, and then if you are going to do uh, a standalone marketing automation, are you, are you going to do that? If you do want those broad capabilities, you're probably going to want, and you're a big company and you have a lot of resources, you're going to want a very powerful platform that does a lot of things and is highly automated and lets you do many, many programs that you couldn't control manually, so very sophisticated flows and stuff like that. If you're a smaller company, you might want more of that niche type approach where they're going to give you high service or they're going to know your industry really well because of a vertical thing or do something else to kind of lower your risk and give you a little more support because you don't have the resources to just do it all by yourself. So those are very roughly, very, very roughly, uh, the kinds of things you want to think about when you're understanding what kind of a vendor works for you. Uh, and the thing to bear in mind, you know, nothing lasts forever. Divorce is really easy. And this is heresy. I've been, uh, most of my life I've been helping people select software. And of course, you always want to make the right choice. I'm just talking about that now. And, you know, you want the system to last. And not forever. Nothing lasts forever. But, you know, you certainly want to have something you're going to be using for, you know, five, ten years, because it used to be so painful to change vendors. Well, in, in the world that we are in today with you know, software as a service, it's actually much easier than it used to be to change vendors. There's still a little bit of pain involved. But, you know, just as divorce has gotten easier in, in, in terms of matrimony, you know, divorce from a system vendor it has gotten easier as well. You've still got to get your belongings, you know, out of the house. Uh, it's non-trivial. But, um, 
you can do that. So you can think, particularly if you're new to this, think about a system that'll last two or three years. And don't even try to project beyond that because the world is going to change, you're going to change, the company's going to change, the marketing automation market's going to change, all these things are going to change. So get yourself started, you know, probably take something that's a little simpler, a little cheaper, lower your risk, uh, just kind of dip your toes in it. It's going to take you two or three years just to figure out how to take advantage of even the simplest of these platforms, because even the simplest of these platforms are quite powerful. And much of the value comes from having those skills as opposed to the technology itself. I mean, even though I say the skill, lack of marketing skill, marketer skill isn't like the chief barrier, it's still certainly an issue and everybody does have to learn these things. So you want to kind of start slow and, and, and have some training wheels and take a system that, that's going to get you started, then you'll understand it. And then in two or three years, if you've outgrown it, which you may or may not have, because again, these systems are really very powerful, even the simple ones, but if you've outgrown it, Okay, now you'll know what you're looking for. You'll be a more informed buyer, and you'll 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 take the next step up. So don't feel that this is this is a lifetime commitment. It really isn't. Um, so final thoughts. All right, out of order. Marketing automation is a business. Vendors have interests. You have interests. Not necessarily the same. Okay, the vendors are wonderful people. They love you to death. They're, I'm not, you know, they certainly want you to succeed. It's in their interest for you to succeed. But they're, even though it's in their interest for you to succeed, they still do have other kinds of interests that are a little uh, different from yours. So just bear in mind that you know they're in the, they're in it to make money. You're in it to make money. Let's let let's be grown ups about the fact that everybody has their own their own needs and they have to match. And the second thing to remember, second second final thought. Can I have four final thoughts? Uh, is that the right vendor is critical of success. So, you know, yeah, vendors have different priorities than you do, and you've got to find somebody who matches because getting the right vendor really will help. They will be people who are given the kinds of services and the kinds of system features that you need and that you differ. So you have to vet, match the vendor to your needs, point number three there, uh, for obvious reasons, for the reasons we just said. Uh, and then finally, and I'd like to end on an up note here, glass half full, marketing automation really does work. Okay, The good news is it's worth the trouble. There are lots and lots of studies, lots and lots of evidence that show the companies that do marketing automation well really do get better business results than the companies that don't do marketing automation well or don't do it at all. So it is worth the trouble. It is worth figuring out what you need. And you will succeed if you do it right and you pick the right vendor and you will be just as happy as a clam. So thank you very much. and. Uh, We'll turn it over to Calvin. Or back to Mike. Great. Thank you very much, David. Um, let me uh, re reintroduce Calvin Sharp, Vice, Vice President of Marketing and Product Development at Lingotech. And he's here to share his experience and tips on how to successfully deploy a marketing automation solution. Uh, Calvin? Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, looks great. Oh, OK, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Calvin Sharps, um, VP of Marketing and uh, Product Development at a company called Lingotech. Uh, we're located in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we do uh, language translation software. Uh, I'm not here to talk about that, but to talk about uh, marketing, lead management, and if you need to use nature or nurture. So first off, I'll just give you a teeny bit of background uh, about Lingotech. We are a translation network. As I mentioned before, we are a translation software company. And we help uh, companies and business create and manage all of their multilingual content. So I kind of have to get that, uh, that spill out of the way just to get going here. Um, but uh, uh, that's the type of company that we are and what we do. So if you look in the past, um, this is even you know uh, a few years ago. Really, the cloud-based uh, marketing automation tools uh, have been around for you know five to ten years. But you know in the, in the past, you know trying to convert users and track leads and all of that was a very very hair-raising or hair-pulling experience. And we like to think of it now as a as a pleasant experience. Um, and, and something that's a lot easier to do and a lot easier to, uh, to implement. 
So the first thing as a marketer, you always have to start out with what you call the plan. You know, people call this a communications plan. They call it, you know, a variety of things. But you have a, a plan. In our case, we have what we call a communication plan. Um, we have a calendar, and that calendar, you know, consists of press releases and coverage, and you know, adwords and newsletters and releases. All the stuff you can see along the left side of the screen here. Um, all of these things are, are, are being coordinated um, through marketing act activities. So what we do is we get into an execution phase. So once we have the plan in place, we now have to say, how are we going to execute this? And so we have chosen, um, in this case, Lingotech plus Leadformix to help automate and make sense of all of the inbound and incoming leads. So as you can see, yesterday's marketers were always kind of a right brain. It was about creativity, clever copy, compelling visuals. Today's marketers have more that they have to do. They have to have a strong left brain. It has to be more analytical, process-oriented, methodical. You have to have uh, orientation towards experimentation and EV testing. Uh, you have to see new disciplines like marketing operations and analytics emerge. And you'll see the second trend is witnessing is the emerge of revenue performance management. This trend is actually built on the first end is a logical extension. Revenue performance management is about managing the top line of the business the way a manufacturing company manages the production process. You need to have some amount of discipline and some predictability. Imagine if uh, you were alive today and applied this, these principles to market. We would map these processes out, establish benchmarks, measure performance against those benchmarks, and then we'd have a culture of continuous improvement. Um, you also start to see uh, folks or companies applying a Six Sigma principle uh, to the marketing function. The holy grail here is to build a revenue engine. And what we're going to do is I want to show you how to get there, or at least how we're attempting to get there, and a framework that is a chart of the journey to this destination. So everyone starts out with uh, mapping out the funnel. If you haven't done this, I would suggest, uh, suggest that you do. Um, but you have a, uh, a uh, all of these things that you're doing to drive demand and, and function. And it's critical here to identify the points of any leakage in the funnel. Uh, where are we losing the most customers? Why? What are the best campaigns that we're, we're uh, running? And then you want to plug those holes. Marketing plays a very big role on the front end of the customer buying process, um, educating the prospects on the category and building the preference for your uh, brand. Once the customer is opening to buy in, sales kicks in. Uh, and obviously, uh, after the sales and marketing can play an important role to upselling the customer and expand the company's wallet. Um, also, have the ability to do remarketing and those types of, of uh, of activities. So the first we're going to look at is the demand generation and the role of marketing. Um, as you can see, this chart maps out to uh, you know inbound nurturing, sell support, selling, close, land, and expand. And we're really going to talk about the, the two, the, the second and the third pillar here, which is the nurturing and the sell support. And as you can see, that this is a continuing cycle of, of churn, and call it, or remarketing or campaigns that you're going to produce that will then kick the, the sales or kick it off into the sales process. And as you can see towards the end, you have an expand where you're going to help remarket or to expand what uh, different uh, offerings you have for your company. So here's the suspects. We have lists, trade shows, press releases, advertising, blogs. Uh, you know, social media blogs, social networks, video sites, live share forums, groups, all of these different things. And what you want to have those are is, is a content teaser. You want to have some sort of an email or a landing page on your website, uh, whether it's a trade show, you're driving them to a specific website, or your direct mail is driving them to click on a link or to look at a link or type in the link. Um, your ad networks are going to be pointing to. And you want to have a content teaser here that is going to get these folks in for uh, more, uh, more looking at your company. 
The second part you want to do is you want to actually score folks. And so we have set up a scoring methodology based on how many people visit the site, what pages they visit, whether they download a particular item, we send them email campaigns and marketing camp. If they return, we capture all of that data. And each person is, is increased in score. So you can see you can add, you know, if someone, you know, hits this particular page, they get 10 points. If they hit another page, they get 10 points. And we go on a scale from 1 to 100, uh, being 100 is someone that's very interested. Um, you know, different things like they click on a PDF, they get a score of 50 or, or, or what you like. You can set those up any way you want. There's no real hard uh, exacting measurement to, to do that. You can play with those numbers and you can determine which scores are best, uh, are best for you. Uh, next thing we look at is using social uh, media for prospecting. We're talking about the Facebooks, the LinkedIn's, the Twitters, YouTube. Uh, I wouldn't discount any of these. These are actually, for us, where most of our leads come from, as well as uh, you know some Google advertising and AdWords and those types of things. So how do we how do we do that with social media? So we have social media, um, and we're going to talk about the, the the content teaser here, kind of at the bottom. And these comes from blogs, micro posts, social networks, video sites, etc. And we push those into the website for a blog or landing pages, and ultimately a, uh, a, a registration form. And we start to score those folks. Now, what's the anatomy of a landing page? Um, you want to have an easy to understand layout. Um, you should have very specific buttons that call out actions and stand out. Um, if you're not familiar, you want to have important information above the fold. That's what people you know, typically see when they first come to uh, a, a page. And once they click on, let's say, request a translation bid or request a demo or 30-day trial, we have a, the, the lead bait. And this is a contact form. And we use this for personalization. We also use it for routing and filtering to, to further qualify. Uh, my opinion in this is you want to have as little information or ask or request as little information as, as possible, but have enough information to make some informed decisions. And so we uh, opt out to only having first name, last name, and email, and, and making only certain of these things required, and then a content type, uh, contact type. And this is, again, used for lead routing and filtering so we can see. So once someone actually fills out the form, uh, we have an automatic fulfillment request. Um, with the scoring that's scored, we auto-fulfill that asset and send them an email and make a, a, a contact with those folks. So uh, auto-responder email is to fulfill the request for the asset. In this case, you know, someone is interested in a 30-day demo. Uh, we have it customized because we've grabbed their name. I got Hoyle Calvin interested in Linda Tech plus Scruple. Uh, I'd like to request a demo. I can click on that and request a demo. And this is for someone saying uh, contact us or they have uh, a hit to a particular page. Now, you also want to use all sorts of different assets to lead and nurture the folks that are coming here. So here's some example of assets we have from us. These are you know one uh, either one sheets or case studies or or white papers that we've written, you already have lots of assets. If you look around your company, um, you have probably you know drives and drives of assets that you can use. You can repurpose the stuff. You never know which of these are going to be successful. So you want to do the AB testing I mentioned before. You want to send out different uh, emails and different uh, kind of content teasers to folks. Uh, you know to drive them to you know, it's less more information. Uh, once you have uh, marketing qualifies all of the inbound leads, so we have a scoring. We showed the scoring a little bit earlier inside of Leadformix. Uh, marketing qualification, uh, we, we set that up. Uh, we then pass that, and when, for us, we actually use uh, Salesforce, and, and uh, Leadformix has a very nice API where we can pass that information directly into, into Salesforce. And what we do is we can now pass these directly to the reps and which ones to uh, automatically nurture. Now, these can be routed to specific people, you know, based on the request or based on, you know, the activity that they have. So if you have 
in our case, someone that is uh, that works with the Drupal community, then we can route it to the Drupal salesperson. If it's someone that's doing the federal stuff, they can be uh, directed to the federal uh, the federal route. And what this does is it automates it so you don't have to make these decisions or you don't have to keep track of, of how these things are getting passed along, which is which is actually very very uh, 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 helpful. So prospects then, uh, after they've been qualified, uh, get a custom intro email, custom emails from sales. We auto intro email them. We send them uh, the sales email, and then we do a, uh, a follow up with uh, somebody that. Uh, on our on our sales team. So here's an example of an automated sales nurture program. Um, this is our 30-day free trial. Um, someone makes a request, and uh, we send them an intro email. We say thank you. We appreciate your you know checking us out. Um, a week later, we send uh, a first email that has uh, some information on that. Um, we have a reply to yes or no. Uh, as you can see, we then two weeks later send a, a second email. A third week we send a, another email with a video on some help tips. And as you can see, we keep nurturing this in that monthly process to get them to continue with the 30-day trial. At the end of the 30-day trial, we have a, a follow-up with a, a salesperson that will then uh, ask, uh, you know, if they would like to continue. Uh, with with the, the program after the trial period. Uh, here's another example of an email that is automated uh, and, and customized. This was part of that free trial that I just showed you, your free account. Welcome to the Translation Network. Here's your 30-day free trial. I'll give you an example of what that does. This is all automated, so you don't have to send that out when someone comes in. And then once someone has been dumped into Salesforce, we are starting to look for buying signs in the prospects, you know, what we call digital body language. And so in this particular instance, uh, when we send this into Salesforce, we're, we're looking at what they're doing. And in this case, we can see that they had, uh, you know, this person had been sent three different correspondences, but they had only responded to the last one. Um, and you can do some filters and some activities um, or reports to see which of your uh, different uh, offers are working better than others. Um, this is part of, again, the A-B testing to see, you know, where you're getting your best thing for your buck in terms of these different, different paths. So we also have what we call, you know, the end of the kind of the piece, the monthly cycle, uh, touch cycle. So we want to keep top, top of mind. So on a monthly or quarterly basis, we do send out to everybody that's in the, the system uh, to keep up the process of engagement, uh, to let them know about new features. Uh, if you go to my sales and marketing chart kind of at the beginning of the presentation, this is kind of the remarketing effort at the end um, and just part of the, the, the nurturing process. So at the end of the day, it's all about measurement. Um, and what Leadformix does a good job is it allows us to measure how successful our campaigns are. So my next chart is something that I use that are leads that I have uh, generated out of the system, you know, based on a score, and then ones that I have actually physically qualified by a salesperson giving them a call and them wanting to have contact information back. And so we keep track of this on a monthly basis to see uh, what, uh, what, how, what things are working and, and uh, which channels and which uh, partners are working the best. We also have another chart that I don't have in this particular case that drills down into each of those activities um, because we track those through the Formix and Salesforce. So did it come from a trade show? Did it come from social media? Did it come from the website? Is it a contact us form? Is it from a partner? We want to see where all of our activities are are being played out so we can concentrate and add you know more money or more dollars into those particular ones that are proving out to be uh, good channels for us. So Leadformix does provide us, you know, our total visitor summary. So uh, they do have breakdowns on, you know, like how many total visitors you have to the site. Um, everything we do, we try to funnel to our website. So we have kind of a catcher's net. Um, so everything from trade shows to social media to ads all try to land somewhere on our website with landing pages. And we can say, we have this many unique visitors, we have this many leads, this many form fills, and uh, we start to get the information about what things and what things are not successful. We can also get into kind of SEO and SEM trends where we say, 
you know, is it direct visits? Is it search visits? Is it referral visits? Is it stuff that we've paid for? Uh, Lee Formix does a good job of keeping track of all of that as well. And so those are uh, measurements for us to use as a marketer to determine uh, which things are the most successful and which things are not. So if you kind of re refer back to my original slide with the lady pulling her hair out, you can see that you know without this visibility, I, I don't know what's successful. I'm, uh, I'm always throwing out, um, if they say 10% of your uh, marketing budget uh, is successful, you just don't know which 10% is, is, it is. Um, we try to bridge that gap with this type of a marketing automation tool to, to know what is performing well. So popular key performance indicators are how are we doing, you know, marketing influence sales over time, you know, how, how are the influence pipeline over time, where are your mar marketing qualified leads over time, you know, which programs are uh, the working the best that you're going to invest in, which channel, which sources, and then which points of the funnel are losing the highest percentage of prospects. You know, can you either fix that or, or not continue down the path of those particular ones? So it's, it's interesting. It's a very good way of determining um, how, how successful you are and, and how things are going. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, again, my name is Calvin Sharps, VP of Marketing and Product Development. Uh, here's my contact information. If you have any questions about this presentation, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me. Great. Thank you, Calvin. Thanks uh, to David and Calvin for presenting today. Now we're going to open it up uh, to questions and answers, the Q&A session. Feel free to ask any questions that you have uh, using either the uh, chat or the questions area of GoToWebinar, and we'll get them answered. Okay, here's our first question. Uh, this is for David. How, oh, excuse me, where can I find statistics to prove the value of marketing automation? There are a couple places that you can look. Um, the research houses, the uh, Aberdeen, IDC, Forrester are all published studies. Uh, Elqua publishes some very good studies. They uh, benchmark their customers. Um, so, you know, just Google around a little and uh, you'll find them. We used to run into that a lot and, and there weren't that many, but now we see quite a bit out there. Great. Thank you, David. Um, next question. You know, Calvin, you talked about assets. Now, a lot of uh, companies that, that, you know, that we talk to, they, they do have uh, challenges when it comes to assets and not, not having, you know, a lot. And so when you mentioned repurposing, I thought that was a great tip. Now, in addition to repurposing, can you take an asset and turn that into multiple pieces of, of marketing material? And if so, what are you know what are the most popular ones that you would use to do so? Yeah, there's there's definitely um, if you have any sort of white papers or um, I would take even if you've written blog posts for someone or you have a blog, you can take that blog, you can turn that into a white paper, or you can simply promote that blog page. Um, what I, what I always suggest people is to do an inventory of all of their assets if they, if they can, if it's, if it's possible. Um, sometimes it, it's too, too big uh, to do that. Um, but you know, if you start to look at all of the stuff you have on YouTube and all the stuff you have on Facebook and Twitter and your blog, you can start to see that you do have items that you can then start uh, to use. Now, I'm not saying you don't ever produce new stuff, but I wouldn't let the lack of assets or what you perceive as a lack of assets from, from having you not start uh, the, auto, you know, the marketing automation process. Um, and simply because you know, the longer you wait, the less data you have to make you know, decisions on. So the sooner you can get stuff out there and start to at least track it, you can have an idea of what's going on. Okay, great. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, next question for David. Does company size matter for marketing automation success? Well, well I think it, any size company can benefit from marketing automation. Um, and uh, it's not even clear from the statistics that we've seen that, that smaller or bigger ones do better or worse. So it has more to do with the commitment and the skill of the marketers and some of those strategy issues that we discussed earlier about finding the right kind of marketing automation that fits your situation than it does about uh, the size per, per se. That, 
that being said, you do have to find this tool that is suitable. Big companies are going to have almost surely a separate CRM system. Uh, so you're going to want a, want a system, a marketing automation system that plays well with, with uh, a separate CRM system. Smaller companies often will want one system to do both. So that's a different kind of vendor and a different set of, uh, a different set of functionality. So you, any, any, any size company can succeed, but you do have to make sure that you match the product and, frankly, the ambitions of your deployment to, to your own set of your own uh, level of resources. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, Calvin, uh, Calvin, you mentioned that you route leads to Salesforce and then to the appropriate sales rep. How do you do that? Is it automated with lead formix or Salesforce or, or manually? So maybe you could just in, kind of describe how – oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, we do that inside of Salesforce, um, and you can do that. There's assignment rules that you can set up based on – what, how, what comes in, and you do that off of keywords. So if a keyword comes in that's, let's say, federal, we run it, route it to the federal rep. If it's someone that's asking our translation bid, we send that to the, our translation services department. So uh, that is uh, a Salesforce function. Okay, great. Thank you, Calvin. This next question, um, both of you might want to answer it. Should I expect to hire a consultant to help with Deployment, David. Why don't you you take that first? Uh, well, you don't have to. I, I mean, and good news is I do not do that kind of consulting, so I can say that if I did that kind of consulting, <laughs> you might get a different answer. Uh, and there are many fine consultants out there who add tremendous value. So it's you know if you can afford it, and if it's your first time doing it, uh, it's certainly a good investment, um, but you don't have to. Uh, the vendors themselves all have departments that are, are customer success departments, whatever they call them, that are designed, that, you know, whose purpose in life is to make sure that their clients have a successful deployment. Some charge more or less for those services. Some provide additional services for additional charges and so on. So again, that's part of that, making sure you have a vendor who has the particular, fits your particular needs. Um, but no, you, you don't have to. So it's like an insurance policy. You know, you don't have to buy insurance either, but uh, if you can afford it and you're a little risk averse, it uh, never hurts. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Calvin? Uh, I would I would say I would agree with uh, David on that. I, I was able to set all of this up with the help of Lead Formix, um, but I do myself have a fundamental understanding and knowledge. Before I, I did implement this uh, a year and a half or two years ago when we did this with these folks. Um, so if you do not have a basic understanding and working of of how this all works, um, I would definitely hire a consultant. If you've done it before. Or if you're just wanting to kind of dip your foot in the pool, you could definitely use, you know, some of the consulting services even from a vendor like Leadformix. Right. And let me just add to that. At Leadformix, we do have a customer success team, and I'm a part of that customer success team where um, our job is to uh, enable our customers, get them started on Leadformix, get them started on marketing automation, uh, and it's all included in your, uh, your subscription fee. And uh, Calvin and I have, have talked a lot, so um, that's yeah. That's and these and, and, and yeah, Leadformix has been very successful. They also have another series of you know customer success webinars that are very helpful that they do. I think once a week or once every other week. Um, and you know, for the first few months of uh, my deployment, you know, I went to those religiously, and at some level, I was able to be proficient enough in the tool, um, you know, not to have to continue to go into those. So. Yeah, if I could add okay, great. Okay, great. Uh, oh, go ahead, David. Point. Um, we always talk about the successful deployment and kind of getting the first programs up and running. It's really important, and this is where a consultant can help, that you don't just like learn a few things and pay attention for three months and then kind of, oh, I got this, and then don't change anything. There are a lot, there's a lot of depth to marketing automation, so it's important to plan to continue to enrich and expand your deployment over time as opposed to just getting things up right away. 
Uh, and that's, 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 that's a very high value matter for a consultant because they can kind of look out that one and two year plan and say, you know, you know let's, let's get these first programs up and running, but then let's not stop there. Let's now, here's what you're going to do after that, and here's what you're going to do after that. So you do want that long-term view, and that's something the that consultants are really good at. Yep. All right. That's I agree. Point. Great point. Okay, great. Uh, looks like we have no more questions, and we're almost at the top of the hour. I want to thank uh, David and Calvin for presenting today. Um, and if you have any questions after this webinar, feel free to reach out to uh, any of the three of us, and we'll get your questions answered. We've recorded the webinar, and we're going to have it up on the leadformix.com website uh, probably in a day or so. We're also going to email out a link to the recorded webinar for, um, for you to rewatch or send to your colleagues. Um, and uh, so I guess that wraps it up, guys. Thank you very much for presenting, and thank you to the attendees for attending. Thank you. Thank you.